So I want to talk today about democratizing fair trade. And there's really two ways to think about democratizing fair trade, right? The first is, how do we get more workers um, to be operating under fair trade uh, conditions and, and, and with the payment system? But the other piece that is equally important is how do we get more people around the country to be consumers of fair trade products? And you know, when we launched Honest Tea, and I'll, I'll talk a bit about the story of Honest Tea, but when we launched it, the goal was never just to sell healthy drinks to healthy people. And as we build our business, our goal is not just to sell fair trade products to wealthy people. We really want to make our products as widely available as we can, for both in terms of access for distribution, but in access of price point, and access and mindset and mind share. We want people to think about fair trade as part of something they should be expecting. In every, you know, we always say with Honest Tea, we want to be everywhere beverages are sold. And we want people to think about fair trade being available wherever consumer packaged goods are available. And I want to share a bit about how this got started. So and people ask me, well, why did you start Honest Tea? And the simple answer is, we were thirsty. <laughs> My co-founder Barry and I, this is a, 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 an excerpt from a comic book we wrote um, a few years ago called Mission in a Bottle. And, um, up in the top left corner is my professor, Barry Nelba, from the Yale School of Management, and that's supposed to be me down in the bottom right-hand corner. And we were doing a case study of the beverage industry. We were talking about what's out there, and, and Barry said, well, of course, we all walk the shelves of the grocery stores. We see literally walls of beverages. Is there anything missing? And it's hard to imagine there's anything missing. But back in 1995, all the drinks had the same calorie profile. They almost all had the same ingredient profile, the same sweetener. And so my hand went up. I said, how come no one's making a drink that's just a little bit less sweet? And so that was really the founding idea. Um, I was in business school, so I didn't do anything about it. I came down to Bethesda, Maryland, and started working for the Calvert uh, Funds, which does the socially responsible mutual funds. And um, I was enjoying the work. But one day, after a presentation in New York City, I went for a run in Central Park. And after the run, I was thirsty. And after I was thirsty, I went to a beverage cooler in a store. And I said to my friend, there's nothing here. He said, well, there's lots of drinks. I said, they are, but they're all the same. And I uh, said, I want to do something about it. I emailed Barry. And I said, I'm ready to move, act on this idea we discussed. And Barry had just come back from India, where he'd been studying the tea industry. And he had come up with the name Honest Tea. And, and if there's ever a moment where I felt like you know, the clouds parted and you know, I heard angels singing, like that's an amazing platform of an idea to build a brand about authenticity, about uh, social responsibility, and of course, natural. And so I started, I left my job in the investment business and started Honest Tea out of my house. Um, Barry came down and I brewed up five thermoses of tea and I got an empty Snapple bottle that I pasted a label on. And we went to the local Whole Foods buying office and said, we want to sell this in your store. And to my great you know, delight slash horror, uh, excitement, the buyer said, OK, we'll take 15,000 bottles. And uh, so we had to figure out how to make it. And uh, then we just kept growing. And so um, we were the first to launch an organic bottle tea, the first to launch fair trade certified bottle tea. And we just, uh, just yesterday, we're totaling up how much we've sold and it turns out we sold 3.5 billion units since we started. So we're still growing. Um, and this is what our growth looks like. And along the way, you can see all the different milestones. And, uh, and the ones that we've highlighted here are, I would say, the steps, important steps that we take on our mission. And I, I, I included this quote. This is a quote that Martin Luther King said, but he was actually paraphrasing uh, Theodore Parker. The arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. And what, what the reason I put it on this quote is because for us, we understand the direction the business has started. But keep in mind, and you can see from when we started very modestly in 1998, nothing was certified organic, nothing was certified fair trade. But we knew the direction. And so we just started with a less sweet tea. And as we started to learn about organic sourcing, we realized tea leaves are one of the few products that's never rinsed. And what I mean by that is if you buy an apple or a tomato, if there's chemicals sprayed on those um, products, you can take it home, you can rinse it or peel it. But with tea leaves, the only time they're rinsed is when hot water is poured on the leaves. So if there's any chemicals on them, that's what gets washed into the, into the drink, into the cup or into the bottle. So we said, okay, we, we better, and then, so we better buy organic. And then as we visited tea gardens, we saw, and you'll see some footage of um, the tea pluckers who, at least in India and China, are mostly women, and they're working up to their armpits. And we're realizing that they're surrounded by these plants, which could be 
fine if there weren't chemicals sprayed on the plants. And then as we thought about more deeply about working conditions, okay, making sure organic is an important first step for their health and their family's health, but what about fair trade? And so that's how we evolved to fair trade as well. And then we continued to um, convert more of our business to uh, fair trade and to organic, but it wasn't until after Coca-Cola purchased Honesty in 2011 that we had the ability to move everything towards fair trade certification for our tea. And it wasn't until just a few years ago, 2016, that we were able to convert all of our sugar to fair trade. So for us, it's a continuous journey, um, but like I can say we know which direction we're headed. Um, and so I want to show now a short video about sourcing tea. This is from uh, a community we source our black tea from in southern India. And I, I want to warn you in advance that this, at least in the tea world, is the highest level of development for a fair trade tea. This is, a, this, was one, this is the footage from the first fair trade tea garden. They got started about 20 years ago in fair trade. And so um, I'm going to talk a little bit later about some of the other sourcing challenges we have around the, the world. Um, but it's a much more basic level of development. You're going to see here schools supported by fair trade funds. You're going to see children in uniform um, who are, um, my son actually taught at this school um, this past year. And was, after, after having, my son taught in Chicago with Teach for America for two years and um, loved the work but found it incredibly draining. And so when I visited this school, I said, I know what's going to restore you. And it was be, you'll, you'll see um, a little bit of the footage of the school. So we'll play this tape. We wanted to learn more about where the tea for our raspberry tea comes from, the people picking the tea leaves, and the fair trade partnerships that we have with the community. So earlier this year, I traveled to Tamil Nadu in India to visit the Korakunda Tea Garden. The tea garden is 6,400 feet above sea level, so it was a long, hilly drive. The tea leaves are either picked by hand or with special shears. The tea workers pick the top two leaves and the bud off the plants. Here's the two leaves, one, two, and the bud. Her <laughs> basket is much more full than mine. Once the tea leaves have been picked, they're weighed and then shipped off to the processing center. Two-thirds of the land is still rainforest, which helps explain why there's so much biodiversity. The landscapes in Korakunda are amazing, but the most cherished asset in the community is the school that's supported by fair trade funds. Thank you. In fact, the school is so impressive that people from surrounding communities try to get their children into the school, even if the parents don't work in the tea garden. We were warmly welcomed and even treated to a local version of the Hokey Pokey. Just for fun, I brought along stomp rockets, a toy my sons and I have always enjoyed. And we even managed to get one stuck on the roof. By the way, stomp rockets are, speak an international language. Um, I've used those in Africa and Paraguay and India and China and no, nobody doesn't love something shot off into the air like that. It's always fun. Um, so uh, one of the things we, we we're proud, we just released Honest Tees. We, every year we put out a mission report. There are some around the, the building and um, in the middle page we have our sourcing map and so while, of course, we documented this one, there are stories like this or, or scenes like this, communities like this all around the world that we connect with, actually from every continent. Um, and so if, yeah, I encourage you afterward to, to you know, get your copy and, and uh, look up <laughs> what we're doing. All right, so, so that's a little bit about the sourcing. Um, we started, uh, it, you know, we always talk about this as a journey. And so, um, as I said, in 2003 was the first 
fair trade product we brought out. It was our peach oolalong. And at the time, we asked ourselves the question. We got so excited as um, I had visited this community in northern India. This was sourced in Darjeeling. And um, when we learned about it, we were, I was so excited. We said, well, could we make everything fair trade, right? Um, if, if it makes sense for one, let's do it for everything. And this was in 2003. There really wasn't enough fair trade tea of a quality and a price point to make sense. And what do I mean by that? That we would have either had to raise our prices or compress our margins to the point where it wouldn't have been a viable business. And we said, all right, well, we understand the journey. We're going to start with one, and every year we're just going to um, identify more sources. And, and the same goes with sugar. You know, back in 2012 or 2013, we started using fair trade sugar just for our lemonade line. We said, if we make every, what if we brought the sugar to all of our, our teas? And we realized we would have been buying over two thirds of the world's supply of organic fair trade sugar, which is, is not healthy for our business from a risk perspective and, and not really healthy for the suppliers either, because if we go out of business, then they don't have, the, their, their business isn't um, you know, healthy. So what we worked with fair trade and with our suppliers to, to develop more fair trade certifi certifications. Uh, as you heard, we contributed more than um, $490,000 in 2017, and you can see we're really getting scale. Um, and I'll show a little bit more about the other things we've been doing. So it's been growing, but one of the things that we always want to make sure we're doing is can we communicate what we're doing to the broader public? Um, and, and it's just the same thing we learned about organic. We learned that initially when people talked about organic, consumers often, when they hear organic, they hear expensive and tastes like cardboard. And so when people hear fair trade often, they don't necessarily, I think people in this room understand what fair trade means, but the broader consumer doesn't really, they might think it's expensive. They also might understand, think it's like, is it free trade? Is it, you know, is it NAFTA? People really don't have an understanding of what that means. So I'm going to show you a, um, how we try to make fair trade come alive. One of the things we do is we have the Honest Tea Mobile, um, and this is a mobile tea garden that we drive around the country. And it is, you can, it looks a bit like a tea garden, but there's pictures and videos um, from our suppliers, and we help illustrate what it means to work with fair trade. We actually um, have an eye, I'll, I'll, I'm going to talk a bit about a project we did with eye care, and we sort of show what it means to do that. We include our sourcing map and the ingredients so people can connect to the source. Um, and then one of the things we did, um, this is interesting, I know Wendy's is a, is, has, is a chain with some controversy, but it is worth noting that Wendy's was the first chain to take uh, organic fair trade tea and make it available um, nationally in their restaurant for fresh brewed. Um, for us, that was a really exciting development. And once again, getting that fair trade logo on every menu board um, all around the country is, is, is a big step. So that was exciting for us. Just last year, we did our first national ad campaign where we, we, we <laughs> We don't use the word fair trade. You'll hear how we talk about it. We talk about community partners and community relations with our suppliers. I'll, I'll play this video for you. 20 years ago, I co-founded Honest Tea with a simple mission. Use organic ingredients to create delicious tea that's just a tad sweet. Along the way, we learned many valuable lessons, like how being fair trade certified helps us invest in sustainable tea communities and how building a better future is really about building better relationships. As our family grew, so did our products and our commitment to always remain refreshingly honest. My bad, we did use the word fair trade certified and we put the logo in, but um, uh, it was, um, I would say it was, it, it, the ad campaign measured really well. We got a nice response to it, but I would say we're still on the cusp. You don't see many national brands that use fair trade in their messaging. Um, so we did, I, and I'm, I'm glad we did. And, of course, that's how we help create more awareness with the consumer. Um, I wanted to share with you, I, I wanted to dig a little deeper on one project that we've just done. Um, and this is exciting because um, we, for the first time, you know, one of the questions people ask is, well, does fair trade make a difference, right? Of course, you know, investing in communities, that, that there's, there's, nothing, there's no downside to that. But how do we quantify the impact? And this, as far as I know, and maybe someone can correct me if I'm wrong, as far as I know, it was the first time we did a randomized control trial between um, what we did and, and uh, looking at what, what happens without the impact. And what we did is we worked with a nonprofit called Vision Spring. And of course, as you know, with fair trade, when we make a, um, a fund a project, of course, the community has to buy into it. So the, count, the workers' council that um, votes on this. But we 
um, I had a relationship with the founder of Vision Spring, and so we proposed this, and the, and the Worker Council approved the idea of um, providing eye care to 4,000, roughly 4,000 villagers and tea workers in a community in a pretty remote part of in India. Most of these people, 90% of the people, had never had any eye care. And so I'll explain what happened. Um, there's a tea garden in uh, Assam, India. Uh, <laughs> And uh, as I said, we screened uh, 3,000. It says 3,885 workers, but it also was um, provided for children as well. And you can see people who um, you know, both got, to got their eyes evaluated. Um, we provided glasses for some, not all, not all needed it. But what's really striking about it is this is a great quote, productivity isn't everything, but in the long run it is almost everything. A country's ability to improve its standard of living over time depends almost entirely on raising output per worker. And so what we found, we provided the glasses um, to whoever needed it. 98.5% of the workers found the glasses useful. Um, we paid for the cost th through the fair trade premium. And this was what was most exciting. The numbers were striking. Workers who were over 50 years old and more saw a 30 percent um, improvement in their productivity and of course productivity is you know quality leaves measured and there is a there is a physical measurement of it and so this is these are dramatic numbers this isn't just like people felt better or, um, but 30 percent increase in productivity is a material difference for these workers and of course the other impact was that um, children who may not have been able to read all of a sudden realized it wasn't because they um, had a learning difficulty it was a physical challenge, they just didn't have glasses. Um, so for us, this was an exciting project and we're looking forward to replicating it with um, Vision Spring. In other, oh, I'm sorry, here it is. Yeah, 32% productivity increase for those over age 50 and 22% average productivity increase. Other products, that, other projects that we've done have uh, increasing access to clean water. So as I said, in northern India, which is much poorer, you know, they're not, we're not funding schools like you saw in southern India. We're helping provide access to clean water. Um, we also, these are vermicompost. This is a way to invest, helping the farmers have, you know, basically infrastructure investments. Um, and then in Paraguay, where we source our sugar, um, uh, there's no real safety net. There's no government safety net. So fair trade becomes a, a form of safety net. And this is a picture of um, a family that had been working in the fields for 40 years. And uh, without fair trade, they, 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 so actually what's interesting in this picture, if you look to the left, you can see a, a hut that is literally sticks in mud, which is where they lived until um, the cooperative was able to provide them uh, a house made of, you know, br a, a brick foundation and much um, sturdier, and that was because of the fair trade uh, <coughs> participation. And then uh, an ambulance, once again, something that um, we might take for granted, but in a remote area is something that can really make a material difference. And then the one that um, I think is easy to overlook, we talk about sustainability, um, and of course, when, when Honesty talks about sustainability, we think about organic, and that's usually, oh, that's you know, because of no chemical pesticides and no chemical fertilizers, that's so important for, for sustainability. But actually, if, if for those of you who know Project Drawdown, the sixth most important way to help prevent global warming and to, to help um, reduce our, the stress we put on the planet is educating women and girls. Because uh, if women or girls are educated, they um, they have fewer children, they have them later in life, and so it's just a much less stress on the planet. So fair trade by educating women is both a positive social good, but it's also a positive environmental uh, good. And I want to, um, we're going to open it up for questions in a second, but I want to first just give you a little bit about um, a sense of how, what energizes me about our business and also I'd say the, the urgency of the work we still have to do. So every five years or so, the UN ranks the average life expectancy of all the countries in the world. There's about 200 countries in the world, and before I share with you where the, US, the United States ranks in average life expectancy, just keep in mind the, you know, the US is the wealthiest nation in the history of the world. We have more knowledge of science and medicine and nutrition than any civilization in history has ever had. We spend more per capita on healthcare than any nation in the world. So with that set up, any guesses what country has the highest life expectancy. This is a good international audience here. I think someone said Japan. Japan is number one, 83 years. Number two, Finland's not a bad guess. All right, we're not getting to the US yet. What about number three? You have to go a long way. You have to go past Cuba. 
past Lebanon, past Chile, to get to the United States. And to me, this is a, a shameful statistic. We're literally not living up to our potential. We have squandered our fortune. We aren't, um, we aren't, we are, people aren't living the kind of lives they'd like to live. And as shameful as it is, you can also think about it as an incredible business opportunity, right? You're buying low. The, the world's wealthiest nation, if you can help people live higher quality lives, there's demand for it. And the key then is, is how do you make that happen? And I will say it's not easy work, but it's also work that needs to be done. I'll close with two bottle clap quotes. These are what, you know, on, on your honest tea bottle, everyone comes with a little message underneath. The first is this proverb, if we don't change the direction we are headed, we will end up where we are going. And that's the wrong direction. So we need to change it. And you, of course, from a climate perspective, it's the wrong direction. From the economic conditions, uh, and the way people are treated around the world, it's the wrong direction. So it needs to change. But it's not easy work. I think you all, everyone here in this audience is familiar with the struggle, right? If it were easy, it would have already been done. Um, and of course, there's a bigger question about a company like Coca-Cola, right? When we sold to Coca-Cola, people said, up, oh, there goes Honest T's mission. You know, they were, they were so committed to organic and fair trade. They were the leaders. Now they're going to, it's going to be diluted. And I'm, I'm very proud of the fact that here we are. Honest Tea has now been part of Coca-Cola longer than we've been an independent company because we were, um, <coughs> Coke first invested in 2008. And I, I believe, and I'm, I'm, I, I think I, I, I can say, I don't say I believe, I know that our mission is, is more rigorous and more impactful than it was when we were a small independent company. One of the exciting things that's happening this spring is that we're going to be launching Honest Coffee in Europe. It will be the first fair trade certified product the Coca-Cola system will be distributing in Europe. Um, so that, well, and of course, Honest Tea was the first fair trade certified product Coca-Cola distributed in the United States. So um, we are absolutely scaling our mission and our impact. Um, and for us, that's, that's the goal. But it's not easy work. Uh, I don't want to, <laughs> we never, we say we never sugarcoat things at Honest Tea, and I'm not sugarcoating that. Uh, and so I'll share with you in closing, this is a quote that is on the wall of our office, and we try to live every day. Those who say it cannot be done should not interrupt the people doing it. And that's why you're all here. Thank you very much. So we have a few minutes for questions. And I know we're going to be doing a panel, too. But um, if there are any questions, comments, suggestions? Sure. Yes. Sure. So the question was our, our relationship with Coca-Cola, that a lot of people here have a harsh opinion of them, and have we had to make any compromises? And um, here's what I'll say. Um, we didn't take the decision lightly, right? We've been growing this for 10 years, um, and uh, we really um, understood. We were never, as I said, never about just selling healthy food to healthy people, so we needed to scale the business to get the distribution. We were in about... 15,000 stores before we sold to Coca-Cola, mostly natural food stores, mostly on the coasts. Today, we're in over 140,000 stores. That's just in the United States, not to mention, of course, what we're doing in Europe. Um, so that part of the goal was met. In terms of um, compromises, there's been no compromise of the mission. I, I really do feel that. And, and, and I always welcome the challenge. If someone can point it out to me, I, and I've said this on our website and, and blogs, I want to be held accountable for it. Um, but I, I, you know, as I said, when we started, only 40% of our teas were fair trade certified. When, I mean, when Coke first invested, only 40% of the teas were fair trade certified. Now they all are. None of the sugar was fair trade. Now all the sugar is. Um, and interestingly, the sugar, the move to fair trade sugar, we have, we, Honest Tea's managed in two offices. We have our office in Bethesda. We have an office in Atlanta. The sugar analysis and proposal came from Atlanta. Of course, I supported it, but it wasn't something that I, uh, you know, pushed on my own. Um, there's been no pressure to compromise any of the ingredients. There has been occasional pressure to compromise some of the language. Um, so, uh, for example, our Honest Kids package, uh, we sell a product called Honest Kids. It's a low-calorie organic drink for kids. And on the box, it, hit, it says, no high fructose corn syrup. Um, and when we were bringing that product to the Coca-Cola system for them to sell, um, they said, well, we'd like you to take that language off. And I said, well, is that a regulatory thing? They said, no, we're just 
we use that ingredient. I said, well, I understand your request, but we're, we're going to keep it on because it's important to the consumer. Um, and so I think one of the reasons that there hasn't been a compromise or, or few, if I were to give strategy tips to someone who's working with a big company, number one, make sure what defines your brand is a, there's objective measures for it. And this is why fair trade is so important. We don't use the word honesty as socially responsible or environmentally responsible. We use the USDA organic seal and we use the fair trade certified logo. And those, as you know, cannot be compromised. Um, and so um, when you have those delineations, uh, even if there was pressure, and there hasn't been, if there was, I'd say, I, I, can't, you can't, I can't do that. Um, and so that really helps. It's almost like having a, a bigger bro big brother behind me who's got, who's got my back. Um, I think the other thing I'll say, and I don't mean to sound self-serving, but it certainly helps when the founder is still involved in the business. Um, and so, um, it, you know, they know when I'm advocating something, I'm doing it because I believe in honesty. And it's too easy when what happens, and I've seen it, and I think we've all seen it with brands, get bought by a big company, some brand manager comes in, they want to recreate the brand, and their goal isn't necessarily to build the mission of a, a business, their goal is to get the next promotion. And so they're much more inclined to um, go along with what somebody says instead of putting their foot down and saying, no, this is not right, and I am going to well, I mean, the, the ultimately, I don't have any legal protection around honesty. The only protection I have is if I leave and say, I'm, this, I, I, I don't believe in it, I'm gone, and, and I'm still here. So <laughs> that's, a, that's a good sign. Maybe one more question before we get our panel. I like that you spoke to the fact that you were not initially able to have 100% fair trade tea and yeah. the same thing with the sugar. Um, but it, sound, it sounded like you're, you always had a very clear vision yeah. of what you wanted your business to be and you were willing to slowly get there and everything. Yeah. Um, but I, I see that as something that would potentially be a problem for a business who's maybe interested in doing the right thing. And they look and they say, oh, can we get this fair trade? Oh, it looks like we can't. Well, all right. Hmm. So yeah. um, do you think there's anything that we can do, that we can do as consumers or that governments yeah. or, or anything can do so that it would already be available in the market so it's a lot easier for yeah. brands to participate in this? Yeah, that's a good one. So by the way, um, you know, of course, when we started in 1998, and Honesty's original business plan is on our website at honesty.com. You can read it. And of course, we don't talk about fair trade at that time because I didn't know Paul Rice then, and, and he didn't have, you know, fair trade didn't exist. I mean, I guess there was from Europe, but um, we, we have a statement around aspirations for social responsibility and talking about wanting to support uh, and spread economic opportunity, but we didn't use those words because, like I say, we didn't know it existed. But we did know the direction, and um, I think there's a very clear answer to your question, which is it's all about consumer demand. And so, um, our ability to, to make others uh, follow our lead, um, but whether it's custom, and for customers to want our product is when consumers reward and seek out fair trade products. I and mean, that gives us in tremendous leverage. And um, I have to be honest with you, I do feel oftentimes that we're still pretty far out there. So I'll talk to restaurants or, or grocery stores and they say, you know, we just don't, we don't, so they'll, they'll say, well, how do you quantify fair trade? How do you quantify the benefit of it? And I, I can't. And what I say, and it's, it's honest, it's not a very compelling answer, is I say I can't quantify it, but I know it's the right thing to do. And I know that our staff and our team and our partners always feel good about what we're supporting and because we believe in it. Um, but the more I could point to, you know, when, when we took the step to become fair trade, here's what happened. I'd love to be able to say, and this is, this, you know, there are, there are a few campuses. Is anyone here from the University of Vermont? No? Honest Tea at the University of Vermont often outsells brand Coca-Cola. So, like, I'd, I'd love to be able to have more examples of universities where they say, look what happens when you choose fair trade. Um, but we need more of that. Um, and so, I'd love, I'd love every campus, and I, I'm not just talking about Honest Tea here. I'd love every campus to feel like, the dining services felt like, boy, we got to have fair trade. Everything that could be fair trade, we at least have to have that option. I, I don't think it's realistic to say you can only have fair trade options. 
but every, every occasion, every meal occasion, every food occasion, if there is fair trade, every university should have that available. And then ideally when it sells well, you'll get them seeking out more. So um, that's, that's the, that, that really is the key. It, it's, it starts with consumer demand. Uh, and that's how you bring it to scale. And of course, we, we um, re, you know, the way we work as Honest Tea, when we have suppliers reach out to us, they say, we want to send you tea leaf samples or we want to send you hibiscus or sugar samples. I say, well, is it organic and fair trade certified? And if they say no, I said, don't send it. We're, we can't even consider it. And so, you know, when you have that bar, obviously that, that motivates others. And I wish I could say we're seeing um, more gardens convert to fair trade, um, but the fact is a lot of the gardens we work with aren't able, they, they sell more tea than there's fair trade demand. So they sell it in the general market without that premium. Um, and, and of course, they wish more people were buying fair trade, so as do I. <laughs>